Stone Cold, the Hellraiser is back. Here we go. Oh. Evolution of the Shield. John Cena versus the Show. Stop him. Hulk Hogan and The Rock in the same ring. You will never take my place at the head of the table. Undertaker on the Hell's Gate submission. Oh, my God. What? My God, Michaels just kicked Cena's head off. It'll be the Rock! It'll be Austin one-on-one! Third and five! Undertaker, do you believe in Miracle? The streak is over! Hey, what's going on, guys? And welcome back to WWE Retro on the WWE Podcast on this Friday, October 14th. As we're going to get right into it today, I've realized that I've done a lot of weird, dumb intros, talking about the weather, talking about sports and all that. But today, we're going to jump right into things as we are going to talk about the return of D-Generation X in 2006. And I thought it was very fitting to talk, pardon me, talk about D-Generation X in 2006 because of what we saw last Monday night on Raw, which I believe is very possibly the last time we will ever get to see D-Generation X in a WWE ring. And that is why we're talking about this because Degeneration X is one of the most historic stables or factions in the history of the WWE. And it's their initial run in 97 and 1998, you know, pre X-Pac, pre New Age Outlaws was something that really kind of spearheaded the Ruthless Aggression Era. I think when all is said and done, Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock and maybe to a lesser extent The Undertaker were guys who really kind of personified the Ruthless Aggression Era and were the ones to really take WWE or WWF at that time to the next level. But it's hard to deny that Triple H and Shawn Michaels and by extension Rick Rude and China as D-Generation X were the ones who really kicked off that era of professional wrestling, the WWF in particular, a time where wrestling was never hotter, never more popular, and never more controversial. And that is really a word that became synonymous with D-Generation X in 1997-1998. Obviously, you go back, right, and you look at the the years of Triple H leading X Pac and the New Age Outlaws. Triple H gets hurt. He comes back. He aligns himself with the corporation and then the corporate ministry, and he eventually becomes a main event star. And they kind of got it, the band back together with the McMahon's Helmsley regime. But Degeneration X never really kind of felt the same. Um, after Triple H got injured and then joined the corporation, especially Billy Gunn left and it was just Xbox and Road Dog, and they tried to kind of carry it forward. Just very, very bizarre, something that I don't find ever worked. Then you fast forward four years later into 2003, and you have Shawn Michaels returning to the company. He actually returned in 02, and you have him start to become a full time star, and him and Triple H. Shortly thereafter, jump into a heated program with one another as opposed to getting the band back together. And something that I think was a very good decision by WWE, because when you brought back Shawn Michaels, Triple H was a bigger star than when Shawn Michaels had left in 1998. And you can look back and I think there's a case to be made for both of them on who was the bigger star. Maybe... In a vacuum at their pure hottest, you would say it was Shawn Michaels because of how great he was in the ring or what he meant to the company in the mid-1990s or his later matches with The Undertaker at WrestleMania. But then when you look at it over the course of time, you could make the case that Triple H was the bigger star because of how he carried the company for almost a decade straight how he transitioned into a managerial role, how he has never left the company, how now he's having impacts on the creative side of things. But whether you're on Team Michaels or Team Triple H, one thing cannot be denied, and that is that they are probably the most dynamic duo 
and best duo <clears throat> in the history of professional wrestling. And I say that in a multi-layered way because not just as rivals, because I don't think they're the best rivals of all time, not just as teammates, because I don't think they're the best team of all time, and not just as friends, because, well, you can't really say who's the best friends of all time, but collectively, I think that they really just make up and continue to make up to this day a, a truly fantastic tandem with one another that now we're reaping the rewards in terms of them running the WWE's creative team. So years go by during the Ruthless Aggression era, 2003, 2004, 2005, and you each have them as big megastars on the Monday Night Raw brand. Triple H predominantly the world heavyweight champion in those years. Shawn Michaels is arguably the top babyface in the company. Uh, although he only held the world championship for one month, which is a crazy thing to think about. But you started getting this, I guess, maybe not suspicion is the right word, but a want to see something different between Michaels and Triple H. Because I'll, I'll use myself an example at the time. You know, I was 12 years old while this was going on, 11, 12 years old in 05 and leading into 06. And I had heard the stories about Degeneration X, but I had never seen it, right? So you wondered what it was about. You know, when DX was at its peak, I was three, four years old. I really had no experience with Degeneration X other than just uh, playback videos and old highlights. And even at that, think about this. We're talking about 05, 06. So it's not like now where you just whip up the WWE Network and you watch whatever you want. It was literally kind of like at the mercy of the WWE, like what flashbacks they would show on Raw or SmackDown or what pay-per-views they would make uh, available that you could buy uh, at, you know, at your local Walmart or whatever or online. I, be I believe online was just starting to, you know, start to become a thing back then. So there was hints that started to be dropped, right? And at WrestleMania 22 was the first one where you had Shawn Michaels in his match against Vince McMahon. And while he's on the top of the ladder, he does the big cross chop. Then Triple H main events that WrestleMania challenging John Cena for the WWE Championship. And in that match, he too does the cross chop. So this is right around the Vince McMahon Shawn Michaels rivalry. And it eventually gets to a point where Shawn Michaels gets beaten out of action. <clears throat> and. Shortly thereafter, Triple H would have the McMahon's eyes set on him. And it was on a Monday Night Raw when Triple H was involved in a lumberjack match against the Spirit Squad when we would finally get the long-awaited return of D-Generation X. Break his damn neck!
And Triple H's or <laughs> Vince's face in all of this was just absolutely brilliant as he just looks so damn shocked at what he's seeing, disgusted when they tell him to suck it. And it's the first time we see Degeneration X together uh, since 1998, these two at least, this rendition of them. So si- more than that, eight years since they had been together. And this is a big deal, right? Because now we're four years removed from Triple H being a babyface. So seeing Triple H as a babyface getting cheered for the first time in almost half a decade is just a sight to see and let alone uh, beside his adversary. Because even though you had heard the tall tales, if you're someone like me, you still didn't really have that live experience. You knew it happened, but seeing it actually live was just a completely different experience. And it became even more real when they made their first entrance as a team back together. You know, they play on the fact that you have tri- that you have Triple H in real life with Stephanie McMahon, which wasn't the case in the first rendition of Degeneration X. And then you have the fact that Stephanie in real life is actually pregnant. And, you know, the, the other thing about this that made this DX this version different was the fact that Shawn Michaels was a born-again Christian now. So you would see reoccurring things with Shawn Michaels as a born again Christian that you know he would kind of stay away from like the stuff that edged that seemed a bit too too edgy and there was one in particular during the 4th of July barbecue where while Shawn Michaels wasn't really ready to push the envelope you had Triple H more than willing to abide 
And in saying that, he abided by going along with a program with a segment that was insinuating some rated R stuff maybe going on below the table and everything. But this particular night on the 4th of July of DX just absolutely terrorizing the McMahons really kind of got going because they weren't allowed into the building. And everything started going really wrong for Vince when Shawn Michaels found something that kind of gave him the upper hand on the rest of Monday Night Raw. Hunter! It's Vince's production truck! The whole show is controlled from in here! Get... The whole show is right from in here. Ladies, after you. So even at this point, you know, you would never see this nowadays where you have like Triple H basically using two young, attractive women to his advantage to get one of the people of the projection truck to walk away. Then they take control of it. They have this segment with Vince Piss <laughs> being rather didn't want to swear there. Almost did, but I caught myself. So no harm, no foul, guys. And then you kind of have. <laughs> I'm still laughing where Vince is in in the bathroom and you have the camera of him peeing in the urinal and then coach coming in he pees on coach and just dx just absolutely ruining vince's life here and it all really culminates when vince gets ready to leave the arena So you have um, Vince just have fireworks go off all in his limousine. He comes out, his face covered in black. It was, and this is kind of the stuff you saw from the X in 2006. And look, it wasn't as, I guess, vulgar, although it did have its moments, but you still had a bit of the, you know, fun loving Sean Michaels doing that but Triple H did really venture on and toe that line of 
you know, hinting to some more adult, I guess, labeled content, if you will. But all through all this funny stuff and shenanigans, you still did have Triple H and Shawn Michaels at odds with the McMahons, which was their very first big feud or during this. And, you know, in at their first match at, I believe it was uh, Saturday night's main event, you had them in a five on two match against the Spirit Squad. And then you had them in the SummerSlam match against the McMahons uh, in a two on two contest. But along the way, you had Vince trying to one up them and they were supposed to have a two on two street fight on a Monday Night Raw. But before the match even got underway, Triple H came out dressed as Vince, Shawn Michaels came out dressed as Shane, mocked them for 10 to 15 minutes. And then when Vince, Shane and the Spirit Squad looked to come out, you had them drop what seemed like feces all over the McMahon's and Spirit Squad. Then you finally get to SummerSlam and the Vince sick, you know, half a dozen heel wrestlers on them like the Big Show, William Regal, the Spirit Squad, uh, Finley, Mr. Kennedy. And even with all of that interference before the match even got underway, you had D-Generation X pick up the victory on the McMahon's. But this seemed to be the breaking point for the McMahons. And the following night on Monday Night Raw, you have the McMahons and the Big Show brutalize the Generation X, bleeding the whole nine yards. And they announce a three-on-two handicap hell in a cell match at the next pay-per-view Unforgiven between the McMahons and the Big Show against the Generation X. And it was... After the big beatdown that DX got, that we saw the return of a side of DX that we had yet to see. Because it was all fun and games before this, but this side was one more that I think the fans were ready for after almost three months of them having returned together. It's been a long time. Since someone has made us taste our own blood. So for that, Vince, we've just got two words for you. Thank you. Thank you. For reminding us just who the hell we are. That's the X. They are the X, and here they come. Hard close in, and the game. Being a stop by security. Trying to figure out a reason for the X. So now all of a sudden we realize that it's going to be a way more brutalizing match between the McMahons and D-Generation X. And for as good as the the return, if you will, of DX had been, it was all kind of fun and games. There was very little seriousness involved. And to kind of prepare ourselves for the first serious match between the McMahons and DX with the Big Show also involved, it was a good wrinkle in this because, you know, you want to also see the serious side of Shawn Michaels and HBK that everyone had become accustomed to um, over the last five years or so. And the match itself was a really good Hell in a Cell match, really gruesome. 
uh, a lot of blood involved. And the ending had some humor in it, but was also just downright brutal to watch. And that would end their program with the McMahons as, you know, Shane coughing up blood after the elbow drop on the steel steps with his neck wedged between it. And after getting his face stuck in the ass crack of the big show, you have Vince have a sledgehammer broken over the back of his neck and obviously a very stiff spot. And it was kind of hard to watch. And, you know, this would kind of usher in a new era for DX at least in their return as they would go on to feud with Rated RKO and it would get cut short unfortunately because Triple H would injure himself at the New Year's Resolution pay-per-view because I really thought that their program against Rated RKO had a lot of potential it kind of breathed new life into Randy Orton's career certainly kind of catapulted Edge and Orton onto the same level as those two if they weren't already Orton had the long-standing history with Triple H. So it really was a good return in 06. But of all that, you know, I did get cut short. You know, you had the the return together when they reunited, I believe, in 2009 to take on Legacy with one another. Uh, I remember they had the, the submission match, I believe it was, against uh, the Legacy at Unforgiven, actually in Montreal. Oh, no, it wasn't Unforgiven. It was Breaking Point. That was it. That Breaking Point in Montreal. I believe that was the last pay-per-view to be hosted here in Montreal. My cousin when I did not, unfortunately. But all in all, the 2006 run probably would have been remembered more seriously if the, the Rated RKO um, match w- or program would have been cut short to Triple H's injury. But even with the McMahon stuff, I thought it was successful. It was an only six-month run because of the the injury to Triple H but all in all a very memorable run and 
it is weird to see D Generation X kind of riding off into the sunset now because yes, we are, what is it? My God, 17 years later, but it really does in a way feel like yesterday that I was watching their return to the company in 2006. But, uh, you know, they, they really kind of gave guys like me who just, just missed the DX era a chance to relive it. And although it wasn't the same, it was no longer the Attitude Era, the WWE was just starting to trend towards a uh, PG product. I believe this happened about a year and a half before they officially made that switch. But all in all, a very memorable time and a very memorable run for D-Generation X. And uh, that's... uh, There's one thing, though... And usually, you know, I end it with my shows with saying, you know, you can catch me on Twitter, Ada Market 25, all this. But I'm actually going to leave you guys with an audio clip and something that I think is a funny and fond memory and a way to remember Degeneration X if we truly do never see them again. So, guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I'll talk to you next week and enjoy maybe one last memory of D-Generation X. Hey, Coachman, you said I beat up Coachman last week. The bloom's pretty much already off that rose. As if it wasn't when we stuck his head through the wall and spray-painted DX on his pickly butt. Good point. So I guess that just leaves Eric Bischoff. I mean, we haven't really done anything horrible to him, have No, no, that's a good point. Besides that, he thinks he's controversial. And... I didn't want to bring this up, but he said that we don't even know the meaning of the word controversial. Oh, us? Yeah. We don't know the meaning of the word controversial. Well, so as much as me, it was mostly you. What, what, are you kidding me? I'm the one that put Bret Hart in the sharpshooter, you know. No. And you? You? <laughs> you know controversial. You married, uh, what's your name? I know, I know. I can't believe what he said. He what said are you t- We don't know what controversy What do you mean we don't know controversy? No, that's you can't we don't know what controversy is. this, we don't know what But what's your name? Stay. Stay. Oh. See? I just can't stand. Calm down, Sean. Don't tell me to calm down. Nobody tells me. And I don't know controversy. You got me. Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show or head to wwepodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to patreon.com slash WWE Podcast. Until then, we'll see you next time.